a program in your hand? Can I see your program for a second? Yeah. All right. So welcome back, everyone, from the break. I uh, hope you enjoyed and are still enjoying our snacks. My name is Yael Harlap, and I'm going to briefly introduce and then continue to be a part of and facilitate the next session, which is entitled Developing Intercultural Understanding, Engaging Students in Difficult Dialogues. But before I say anything more, I'd like to introduce Tom Patch, um, who is the Associate Vice, Vice President Equity at UBC um, and heads up the Equity Office to help introduce us. Thanks, Yael. Uh, as you probably know, intercultural understanding is one of the the nine central commitments in UBC's new strategic plan, Place and Promise. Among other things, it says, the university engages in reflection and action to build inter intercultural aptitudes, create a strong sense of inclusion, and enrich our intellectual and social life. UBC is a diverse institution. Uh, if you look at our student body, it, it, it reflects Vancouver. Uh, and our international students come from about 140 different countries. Uh, UBC recognizes and plays and promise recognizes that diversity as both an opportunity and a challenge. Uh, it's an opportunity for advancing learning by opening up the university to the vast range of perspect per perspectives that diversity brings. The challenge is, as Place and Promise says, to make UBC a safe place for significant conversations across profound cultural differences. A couple of years ago, I was asked to co-chair a committee to develop an equity and diversity strategy for UBC. During the consultation process, we heard from both students and faculty that UBC doesn't always feel like a safe place for those conversations. Minority students reported classroom experiences in which they felt uh, offended uh, or uh, at the very least felt that the conduct was insensitive. Um, sometimes it was the conduct of the, fa the instructor. Uh, more often it was the conduct of their classmates. Uh, but often they reported that instructors didn't seem to know how to deal with the situation. We also heard from faculty that they felt inadequately prepared to deal with intercultural issues when they arose unexpectedly in the classroom, uh, fearing that sometimes their getting involved would just make things worse. These are difficult issues. They're challenging issues when they arise in the classroom. Uh, and we need a variety of techniques to uh, learn how to deal with them more effectively. The session that's about to happen uh, is, is um, the Living Lab Initiative, uh, which is a really innovative approach to engage these uh, challenging issues through theater. Um, it's an important part of UBC's commitment to intercultural understanding, uh, though it's just a, a small part of a, a much broader um, uh, strategy that we're, um, uh, we're gradually unfolding. I hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, I, I think you'll find it an, an engaging uh, session. Thank you. Yeah, let me take the mic. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Turn this off. yeah. Thank you so much to Tom. And we are definitely indebted to Tom and the Equity Office because the Equity Enhancement Fund actually seeded this theater-based project. So we're going to jump in and have fun and get you involved and engaged. But first, I just want to take a few minutes to kind of set the stage, good pun, and help you to understand why we're doing what we're doing, why it's important, and why we choose to do it in this particular way. So Tom already helped to connect the issue of intercultural understanding, the pillar from UBC Place and Promise to what makes an exceptional learning environment, which is our theme here for today, right? So the UBC plan states really specifically about intercultural understanding. 
The university engages in reflection and action to build intercultural aptitudes, create a strong sense of inclusion, and enrich our intellectual and social life. And substantial research demonstrates the importance of inclusivity in learning environments and the value of engaging students in discourse about difference. I'm not gonna go into that literature in depth here because that would be a whole hour at least in itself, but one thing I do wanna say, um, and I didn't introduce myself maybe. My name is Yael Harlap and I work at the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology on issues of intercultural understanding, equity, and diversity in teaching and learning. So at CTLT, where I work, we're in the process of developing a bibliography around these issues that will be eventually available on our website. So I'd like to sort of ask you to direct yourselves to that, but hold off for a little while. Um, but I do want to quote briefly from a draft paper that was written by our university president, Stephen Toop. Professor Toop wrote in August 2009, released a draft paper called Promoting Intercultural Understanding. And he states, to the extent that the university fails in enabling students to function effectively in situations of profound cultural difference, often where there are real and perceived power imbalances as well, we all suffer from the consequences. We don't know how to have the conversations we need to have. Conflicts escalate when polemics and confrontation prevail rather than reasoned debate. As an institution, we have a choice to send out students who replicate this pattern of failure or to nurture the skills and competencies that can produce far more productive social interactions. And I would add that for us to be able to help equip our students, we also need to all equip ourselves to have those very same conversations. So there's no sense in saying, oh, students fail at doing this without recognizing that we often, as educators, as staff, as people who work in this big place, often fail as well. And so the first question is, how do we equip ourselves to do this work better? So once you're persuaded that this is important and worth doing, what makes it difficult? Why is this something we fail at? Um, I would say partly it's because it involves developing new expertise in subject areas that we may not be experts in already, but also because it involves taking risks of raising issues of identity and difference that many of us have a hard time discussing, even in our own social groups and not in a professional context. The risks of being uncomfortable and the ability to facilitate those conversations, to have the awareness of what's happening for your students and for yourself in such a conversation and having skills to engage students in dialogue that may be difficult for them as well as for you. So today what we're gonna do here for the next hour is to explore together a particular moment, a particular challenging and heated moment in a particular class. So this moment that we're talking about is a fictional moment, but it's also very, very real. It's based on real stories, and when we have performed it in different settings, the reaction we have tended to get is, oh yes, I know this moment. So I hope this is a moment that will also speak to you. Um, and we're gonna do it using the language of theater. So I'm just gonna tell you in advance, you're not just gonna sit back and watch a play. We're gonna do it together. But first, I wanna quickly speak about why use the language of theater to do this work. Um, at UBC in this place to talk about challenging situ teaching situations related to intercultural understanding, equity, and diversity. There are a few reasons. For one, theater is really about stories, and we have been, as human beings, learning and exploring issues through stories way longer than we've been learning through lectures and workshops, right? So we know that narrative and storytelling is a really effective way to engage people in learning and exploring issues relevant to their lives. Also, theater gives us the opportunity to connect with what we know up here and what we know here, right? So the university is sometimes a place where emotions are not allowed, but we know in reality that emotions are an important part of learning in general in the classroom and also as we learn to develop the skills we need to facilitate these kinds of conversations. Um, a number of research intensive institutions in the United States in particular have used theater in precisely the way that we're gonna use it here today. For example, the University of Michigan's Teaching Center has the CRLT players and they've pioneered this work in the university setting. Um, Harvard University has the Bach players, the University of Missouri has a theater project. So we're not 
you know, we may be breaking ground in some ways by bringing this kind of innovative technique here, but we're not the first to do so. Um, the University of Michigan in particular has done some research around their work using theater in educational development, and they found that the participants find the issues relevant to their teaching, that the interactive discussions enhance understanding of difficult issues, that the participation in the theater work made participants think about familiar interactions and situations in a new way, um, and in follow-up surveys, instructors who have attended the sessions pay more attention to the effect of their own actions on students and they design assignments and make classroom management choices that work more uniformly for the student body. Um, so I have an article here. I made 15 copies in case people are interested in seeing some deeper explanation and grounding of this kind of work. So if anyone wants one, you can come get one at the end from me. And if there aren't any left, I can point you to where to find it. Um, and I also just want to say that we also are engaged in just having started a research project looking at the impact of this work on our campus. And we're not collecting data today here, but we have been collecting some data and are just in the very, very beginning process of starting to analyze it. So hopefully soon we'll be able to actually support and undergird why are we doing this and what do we get from it. Okay. The kind of theater that we're about to do fits into a broader framework of interactive theater called popular theater. It was pioneered by Brazilian educator, director Augusto Boal, who was very deeply influenced by fellow Brazilian Paulo Freire, who is an educational theorist, philosopher, and um, activist. Um, let's see, what else do I want to tell you? Augusto Boal developed this set of techniques called theater of the oppressed. Uh, he used these practices to engage people in theater-based exploration of their own lives with the purpose of creating critical consciousness and awareness so people will be able to take action to improve their own conditions. So this is not a kind of theater that is designed for actors to do. It's for everyone to use to engage in exploring issues that are relevant to themselves. And if people want to talk more about Boal, please approach me. I'm always happy to do that. So this is what we're going to do. You're going to see a play. It's called, this technique is called forum theater. You're going to see a short, short play. It's about five minutes long or less. It shows a problem that does not have a solution. It's an unresolved problem. You're going to actually see it twice. The first time, you just get to soak it in. The second time, you actually get to stop being a spectator and become a spect actor. You're going to be energized and engaged to actually stop the action on stage come up, replace a character, preferably the instructor, and try to create something different to happen on stage so that the environment turns into a place that's a good place for all students to learn. Okay? So I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail after you see the play for the first time. But one thing that I want to be really clear about, really, really clear about, this is not about finding a solution. It's not about finding the right strategy. Okay? We're not here to see the situation and fix it. We're here to explore a situation in order to create among us a deeper awareness and understanding of the complexities of a situation. And perhaps a motivation will arise in all of us here to go forth in our own lives and think more deeply about the complexities that you see in situations that you encounter that may be similar to this or may be somehow related. So again, sometimes people feel like because we're trying different things and seeing what happens, it can feel a little bit like, let's solve this problem. We're not going to solve this problem. And even if we did, it doesn't matter because every situation you encounter is particular to its context. So whatever might work to, quote, fix the problem here is not going to work to fix the next problem you encounter, right? So strategies arise from understanding the context that you're in. So that's what this is about, exploring the complexities and developing a deeper understanding of the context. OK, I'm done talking. Let's see what time it is. Oh, longer than I want it to be. Let's start playing. OK, let me call our actors out, who I will introduce at the end. Yay, welcome. All right, so find your places. I'm going to maybe. Can I roll this out of the way? Where are the people who are responsible? Can I roll it? Yeah. I'm just going to move it so you can see what's going on. Oops. OK. That's fine. So you're going to see a short scene. Watch closely. It's going to go by quickly. 
Um, and I guess that's all I'm going to say. Um, excuse me. Are you going to go over the guidelines to the paper? Um, not right now. I'm just preparing for class. But um, maybe at the end if there's time. Excuse me. Were you here last week? Uh, Do you know if about the guidelines to the paper? I, I don't know. Ask me later. Okay. Hey, how's it going? Hey, were you here last week? Okay, everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about the book we read, A Thousand Splendid Sons. Um, we're going to start. Does anyone remember where the story took place? Come on, anyone? Yes, the hair. Afghanistan? Afghanistan, right. Is that where your family's from? Uh, no. Okay, so a few of the characters in the book that we need to remember, uh, the main characters are, are Miriam, um, Layla, Rashid, Okay, so we're going to brainstorm some of the major themes from the book today, and then we'll spend the next few weeks discussing them in greater detail. Um, so, so what are some of the themes that you remember from the story? Come on, guys. Yes, the hair. Shame. Shame, okay. Yeah, anything else? War. War, right. Anything else? Relationships between men and women. Relationships between men and women. I'm just going to write men and women. Great. Does anyone else have anything, any major themes they remember? Yeah. Feminist issues? Feminist issues. Okay, could you get a little more specific? Like the veil thingy that women wear? Uh, right, well that, that wasn't really at the forefront of the book. Um, is there anything else? Domestic violence? Domestic violence, okay. But isn't that just part of the culture? Well, isn't it? A third of the 90% of women in Afghanistan get beat. Uh, well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, yes. so that was the play, right? That's our classroom with an unresolved problem. So what I'd like you to do before you transmogrify into spect actors is actually just turn and talk to a neighbor for a few minutes about what did you see? What did you see going on on stage? Just in this classroom. Find someone next to you and have a quick conversation. Yeah, all over the lights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, are you looking at me? Should I answer? <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, it's like audience, yeah. yeah. I'm sure they can talk about it. I'm sure like we wouldn't really need a mic. <laughs> like I'm sure yeah. we could have talked about it. I'd rather just not use mics, yeah. Me I too. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the part. Like, so, yeah, Sahara in particular is like, is a little echoey. So 
so Sahara, if you could try to speak really a little Clearly? bit stronger, just because okay. the mic is like going yeah. through okay. the room. Yeah, okay. you back. There's obviously more that you could talk about. Ooh, is that this mic? No. Um, our mics are booming. It's, yeah, it happens. So you could keep talking, but instead, let's transform the conversations that you had in your pairs and small groups into action on stage, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to see this again. And this time, what's going to happen is you're going to, when you see in especially the instructor. We're really focused on the instructor here. So when you see the instructor struggling, you see a situation that's causing a struggle on stage, say stop or freeze, and please say it loud enough so that we can hear you. And then we'll stop the action and invite you to come up, which I know is scary, but you can do it. <laughs> if, you, if nobody says stop and nobody comes up, this is a very short play. It's going to just be gone in a flash, and you will have missed your opportunity to make life better for these students, right? So that's, those are the stakes. You know, if nothing happens, if you don't come up, the scene is going to end in exactly the same way. Um, when you come up, you'll replace the instructor. If you have a really strong desire to replace someone else, I'll allow you to do it. But remember that this is not about changing personalities of characters on stage. They're the same people that they are. It's not magic here. We can't make the world better by taking out and replacing the people we think are causing the problems, right? We have to work with what we've got. So you'll come up and I'll say, okay, who do you want to be? What's your name? Where do you want to start from? And then you'll start and I'll stop you after just a few minutes. But keep going till I stop you. Just improvise with them. Do what you would do. And um, don't worry, when I stop you, it's not because you're a terrible actor. It's just in the, you know, to be able to have a discussion about it. All right, so anything else I need to tell them? Yeah, we're not going to start from the very beginning. We're going to start after the students, after the 10 minutes later sign. So when the instructor says, well, what themes do we have here? Because that's, because, and let me tell you why. Sometimes people want us to go to the very beginning of the class and say, well, I would have set it up completely differently right from the start. Fair enough, you would have, and this could still happen, right? So because we're not dealing with the broad pedagogical question of how do you set up a class, what kinds of teaching methods are most effective, we're talking about what happens when a situation comes up that you're not expecting and you have a responsibility as the instructor to do something with it. Okay, so I'm just saying this to avoid saying, but I would have like set ground rules and blah, blah, blah from the very beginning. Yeah, we're not going to go there. We're dealing with this moment. All right, so before we start, I'd like to warm you up to become actors. Please stand up. <laughs> Do a 360 degree turn. Good job. Sit back down. You're officially warmed up. <laughs> All right? So, great. All right, so we're relying on you to help make this a different scene. And I'm going to wander around and start like hounding you if nobody comes up. So let's start the action again from when you ask them about themes. OK, so today we're going to explore some of the main themes from the, the book. Um, and uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to explore them in greater detail. Um, so what are some of the themes that you remember from the story? Major themes. Y'all, you read the book, right? Right? Yeah? Yes, the hair. Shame. Shame. Okay. What else? War. War. All right. Anything else? Relationships between men and women. Okay. Relationships between men and women. Anyone else? Feminist issues? Fe 
feminist issues. Okay, could you get a little more specific about what you mean by that? Like the veil thingy that women wear? Okay, well that wasn't really at the forefront of the story. Um, anything else? Uh, domestic violence? Domestic violence, okay. But isn't that just part of the culture? Well, isn't it? I've heard the 90s. Stop, yeah, thank you. Big Okay, Paula, that was a really interesting comment that you just made. I'd like to kind of know how that inform how you were informed by that. What um, made you kind of pull that out of the book? Just from the book, because um, one can of the you explain it in terms of the characters or? Um, I don't really recall. I think it was um, it was Marion that had to wear the veil, so I thought it was important, an important part in feminist issues. And how would you relate that back to violence against women, though? Um, just having to cover up, I suppose. I don't know. Do you have any experience with this? Mm, not really, just from the book. Okay. Yeah, I just read the book. So you don't have any personal experience? Mm, no. Okay. All right. Come on, guys. Come on. Yeah. So if you don't leave yet, you can stand here for a second. So your, strat your approach here, what, how would you name it if you had to give it a little title? Ownership of uh, ownership of comment or ownership of opinion, and I just was trying to draw out a bit. Um, it was quite a big statement that you made, and I I wanted to draw it out a bit and have it more of a teaching moment for the entire class. Mm -hmm. And how did you feel like that worked? Actually, just hold on. A second. You know, I'm not an instructor, so I'm going to just state my own entry into this situation, and so I'm not very experienced in the class and that dynamic, but I. You know, I just wanted, it, I saw her, her discomfort, you know, when I was started. I felt like I was picking on you, because um, I was mad. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my lack of experience as an instructor, so I think that this is perfect because, you know, the discomfort is what we need to mm -hmm. rehearse more, go through these situations more. So. That's great. Thank you, Amy. And as far as other people are concerned, what did you see happen in this interaction? Did you see anything change? Who saw something change? Some and some. So can anyone share why? What did they see change? Alice? Um, Loudly. Mm -hmm. So it's asking the student to really take responsibility for defending her position, right? And figuring out if she doesn't, if there's nothing underneath it, that she maybe needs to do a little bit more work. Did your, did you figure that out, Paula? What, where did it leave you? Um, I felt kind of in the spotlight, and I felt like I had to, I had to think about what I was saying. And uh, but yeah, I was just saying like, like my opinion from the book. So, and that's what we were discussing, the book. I'm wondering if this interaction with the instructor, the new instructor, would that, do you think that would have changed what happened afterwards? Some people say yes, one person, two people. Does anyone think it not necessarily would have changed what happened next? Some, Joanne, Alice, and everyone else, the great unwashed masses who don't want to speak, right? But we'll get you there. So great. Well, thank you, Amy, for coming up and giving us our first approach. And now let's see, does anyone else have an approach for that moment? For the moment where Paula says, well, the veil? Does anyone else want to come and give it a shot, a different try? Yay, Nayeli, applause.
all the people I know coming up. <laughs> Great. The instructor? Thank you. From that same moment where Paula says her line? Yep. Okay, would you say the line, Paula? The veil thingy? Like the one women wear? Um, so, if I understand you correctly, Paula, you're saying that by using the veil, by using the veil, there is, is there is this discourse about violence in the book? Yes, I suppose, yeah. Like, yeah. Do you think, is there that expression of sense of violence expressed in the book? Like, does Mariam expresses it? Um, well, I remember she gets beat by her husband, but um, the veil, not really violence, just like oppression. So that's what you understood from that situation, but you didn't read it as the author was expressing it. Um, I just, just my reaction from the book. So it was your reaction. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So it is important to understand how reactions about looking at movies or reading a book makes us feel about a certain kind of literature, right? That's it. Okay. <laughs> so how would you name your approach if you had to give it a short title? Uh, focus on the content. Focus on the content. Bring it back to the content. And there was also something else there around, I think it's me. I'm, I'm feeding back. If we get too far. OK. <laughs> So focus on the content, and there was also something else about like connecting it to the student's own experience of the content, sort of rooting it in the student's experience of the content as well. Mm -hmm. And how did you feel like it went? Um, I think um, it went well. <laughs> so I don't know. I feel that it's very difficult to know if it went well or wrong. And uh, I think that every time I'm in the classroom, I never know, actually. So um, at least from my perspective, it's always about my perspective, but from my perspective, I felt that I made it a little bit more clear what was stated in the book and what was about the reactions that we could have about. Mm -hmm. So separating, because if the veil wasn't really an issue in the book very much, trying to create that separation. What about other folks? What did you, what did you see, observe, notice? So that Nayeli was able to kind of deal with separating out content and the student's personal interpretation or experience of the content and then leave it in a place where the class could continue. Okay, any other observations? Yes. Mm -hmm. So she also engaged the student who had been a very disengaged student. Thank you. Were you going to say something? No. Yeah. Contrast between the sort of similar interventions, but with the first one, she started to go to a personal, trying to draw out whether you had ever had a personal experience with domestic violence. And I thought that would just take you down a more dangerous road if you opened that can of worms for somebody. That, that's why you felt like she's on the spot, I guess. But this would focus on the content and your response to it and interpretation. It kept it in a very safe, safe container, I felt. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to repeat it so everyone can hear, because I'm guessing at the back you couldn't. So that comparing the two interventions, that the first one was a little bit more focused on asking the student to kind of defend her statement or connect it to her personal experience, which she may not have had or not known how to dealt with, and it made her feel on the spot. And in this second one, it was more about her interpretation of the work, the content. That, the content. Great. And I saw you were going to no, suggest. 
Mm -hmm. So sometimes the personal connection to the content needs to be recognized in the class. So there is different ways of looking at it, which is great. I mean, if we all agreed, there would really be no purpose in having a conversation, right? So actually what we want to do is sort of start to pull out the disagreements that we have amongst ourselves in order to better understand what's going on up here. So if you ever really strongly disagree with someone, that's perfect. Please share it with us. All right, thank you, Nayeli. Thank you. Us. All right, let's move to the let's move to the next moment, kind of in the. So we had Paula talking about the veil, and then um, Sarah, if you could come back, instructor. Um, yeah. So maybe Tom, if you could um, offer your oh feminist issues, the veil, and then if you could ask, is there something else? Yes. Sorry, I needed to rewind in my own head. So, anything, anyone else? Domestic violence? Domestic violence, okay. But isn't that just part of the culture? Well, isn't it? I've heard that 90% of women in Afghanistan get beat. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Jumped in. Okay. Um, Great. So, Paolo, would you jump Actually, no, can I go back to Tom? Is that possible? Yes. Yeah. So, Tom. Uh, yeah. Domestic violence? Hmm. But isn't that just part of their culture? Just a moment. I want to go back to what Tom said. Um, what information have you gotten about domestic violence in this setting? Where uh, has that come from? Uh, well, there's a whole bunch of times where Rashid. Um, beat his wife. Okay. Um, if we take it out of the book, what information about domestic violence issues uh, in Afghanistan have you received? Where does that information come from? Uh, I, I don't really know. I, yeah, just from the book. Uh, that's all I know really about Afghanistan. Okay. Okay. Hey, awesome. Yeah, great. Which was in some ways similar to Amy's in connecting it to where do you know the information from. And could you explain a bit what your goal was in doing that? Um, yeah, I guess in readings that I've been doing lately, I'm in uh, the language and literacy education program. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about what ideas people bring to their readings. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's extremely limited knowledge or very biased knowledge, but it's hard to recognize that, even for me. So just having students reflect on like, what knowledge they may have brought or not brought, and so they're using this one incident in the book to kind of um, blow up an idea. So just having them examine that and be like, hmm, where, what, do, what am I coming to this with? Mm -hmm. Might help, and I think it might have been also applicable to the veil comment, like the veil thing, like, Okay, what images have you gotten? Where have those come from? Mm -hmm. Do you think someone who with a different background might be reading that differently? Mm -hmm. Great, so trying to ground it again in sort of student knowledge that goes beyond the immediate content but then informs their reading of the content? Yeah. Great, thank you. What about other people? What, yeah, not quite yet, we're not done yet, but so stay here just a second. What did you see? Do you think that would have worked? In what ways would it have worked? Mm -hmm. um, I think it would have worked with Tom, definitely, uh, because it made him think about where he got the information from. Um, I'm not sure it would have worked with Paula, because her comment, because her comment was just kind of ignored in a way. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, you're saying this approach addressed. Tom and brought it back to him, but it kind of skimmed over Paula's comment. Yeah, because 
Paula has been very unresponsive during the class, and so yes, the, the, the interaction between Tom and the professor could have definitely helped her as well think about where her comment came from, but because she's been so unresponsive, maybe she wasn't even listening. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that that interaction between the instructor and Tom still didn't get Paula to think deeply about her own reactions, right, if she checked right back out again. Did you check back out again? I did. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, guess, I guess one option is, like, if her comment had been made and I'd been like, just hold that, I don't know if that would have been possible to then say, all right, Tom's not sure, like, what background knowledge or if he has much background knowledge. But, Paula, you made an interesting comment. You seem to have gotten some information. Um, do, you know, do you know where that came from? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that? It's really interesting yeah. that mm -hmm. you, you have some information to share. Got it. So that would be then going back to Paula and kind of, in a way, validating her comment by interrogating it more deeply, right, her contribution. So great. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Does anyone else want to try a different approach to dealing with this situation? I see two hands. So maybe let's do Joanne first and then Nada. Come on up. Thank you. Welcome. Let's applaud for Joanne. Yeah. Can't applaud with the mic. All right. And you don't want to use the microphone. Can you speak loud enough? I think I can speak loudly enough. Everybody, anybody can you hear? No. 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 Use the mic. Oh, we'll use the mic. <laughs> okay. Use the mic. Um, I would like to start um, as we begin to look at the uh, issues here. Okay, so just from when you say we're going to brainstorm some themes? Yeah. Okay, so we're rewinding. That's all right. Okay. Okay. So um, I know that you've all read the book, and we're going to be looking at some issues in this book, and we're also going to be reflecting on how these issues are actually mirrored in some of the issues that come up in other countries, in other cultures, and other situations. So these are not just lying in the book. They also are outside of the book. But let's take our focus right now and look at some of the main themes that are coming up. So can I get any uh, themes from people who are uh, sitting here? Yes. Shame. Yes. That's a good one. That's, that's always one that comes up a lot of the time. Uh, what else? What else is happening here? Yes. What? War. Huge topic. We're looking at Afghanistan here. We're looking at war in Afghanistan. We may be also looking at war in a variety of other places, at Canada's participation in Afghanistan in war. So war is, is huge. It's not only for Afghanistan. The book has been about that, but we're also going to be looking at what happens outside. So war, yes. Give me another one. Yes. Relationships between men and women. Another big one. Uh, men and women, what's happening there? How do we interact? Uh, yeah, great. Another one, come on. Yes? Feminist issues? Feminist issues. What do you mean by feminist issues? Let's go a little deeper there. Um, well, uh, the characters in the book, there are these pretty strong women. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so sort of they're being feminists, I guess. Okay, so being feminist. So that's going to bring us into a discussion of what does feminism actually mean. And that's going to be another theme that we can begin to look at, looking from Afghanistan and perhaps to Canada. So we're going to, I'm going to write that down up here as, as another issue that we're going to be looking at. And what does feminism mean within different uh, contexts? Another one. Um, well, on, on feminism, like the, the veil thingy that women wear, the veil thingy. What do you mean by the veil thingy? Uh, Can you be a little it's like in the book, they wear the, the veil. Okay. So they're wearing a veil in the book. Is that part, and this is a question that we're going to have to look at more deeply in terms of what does that say? What are, what are particular items of clothing? What do they say? What do they say about values? What do they say about faith? All of those issues are more generalized as well. Anything else here? Uh, domestic violence? Domestic violence. Okay, another huge one, domestic violence. But isn't that just part of the culture? That is a really interesting question. 
because what does domestic violence mean? Where is that going to be taking us? So that is something that we're going to have to really explore. Domestic violence, is that cultural? Is that questions of power, of who controls? Where does that happen? Is it endemic in all societies? What are people's feelings here? Is, does domestic violence happen in all societies? I know, I know, I keep trying to give it away. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me right now? Yeah, okay. So that was a long one, but I got the sense Joanne wanted to play it out, so I left it up there. Um, mm -hmm. How would you name your approach? Trying to uh, get students to go from the particular to the general to be able to form more of a developed uh, problem analysis and seeing that, it's, that it may be being portrayed in a particular circumstance within the literature, but that literature is more generalizable. Mm -hmm. And what did you see happening up here? Yeah. And I, I think the second question um, put up by, by Paula um, is fixed. And uh, if I am Paula, I'll be satisfied. But the first question, I'm still, I, I'm not convinced. And uh, I'm a little, you know, uh, uh, very doubtful. Because uh, you, um, you, you just uh, talk a little bit about it. And uh, you, um, obviously, you don't agree with me. So you go on. And uh, I, I felt a, a little angry, actually. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So yeah, go ahead, Mary. I would just say that's really interesting, because I think I had a very different reaction. Because um, I saw you not getting trapped by Paula's question. Isn't it right, teacher? Like, and taking mm -hmm. like the pressure off the teacher to answer that question, and making it a more general question about domestic violence in all cultures, where does it happen? Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, maybe the student wasn't satisfied, maybe you're right, uh, but I think, I think that was still a very valuable approach. Mm -hmm. Any other takes on what was going on on stage? Yes. Right, so critical thinking, getting analyzing these what you called vacuous terms, so it's very broad. Yeah, and that's a challenge when you're doing a brainstorm to get themes, right? You're going to get the broad themes. What do you do with them? How do you contextualize them? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the constant comparison to the Canadian context that we're in, and so maybe in order to find some commonalities and not create that kind of us over here and then the other over there. Mm -hmm. the, the strategy um, that Lynn used of um, identifying the, the big picture issue, and then almost giving herself time to, to go away, think about it, reflect on it, and, and we're going to deal with that. about that because um, because if these issues are hitting you at the time, you don't always know exactly how to deal with it in the moment. Mm -hmm. So I like that. Mm -hmm. And Michelle, so just so that everyone could hear it, part of that approach that Joanne took gave her time to sort of think about how to respond, right? She wasn't like rushing to respond to the students. She was kind of re being reflective in the moment and giving students time as well. Michelle. Yeah, that's, that's what I noticed as well was the pacing that mm -hmm. she used in that where she slowed things down where they needed to, in one sense, to give that space and actually got her to aunt, get her to put her hand up twice, which I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. So you were paying attention there. Yeah, she and, got more engaged, yes. right? We saw Paula yeah. more engaged because she's actually getting more interested in saying what she wanted to say. And then the other piece was um, you had it at a particular pace, and then as soon as she asked that question, you stepped in, even if you know you're kind of going, "That's inter," you know, you didn't. Had to use the same pace. Your pace changed, and it was kind of like you sped it up slightly right then, which was really interesting. 
And I'm curious what people saw going on with the students, right? Because so far the conversation has been mostly about what is the instructor doing, but what's going on? What did, what did you see happening? Because you were watching it all. So did you see anything change with the way the students were engaging? They're more focused. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Alice, go ahead. Yeah, take the mic. Um, I think <laughs> I think they were like in the first version they were kind of sitting down very comfortable kind of not caring and when you started asking questions or telling them that you would like answer the questions during the semester they kind of got more attentive they all sat up a bit they were more in the class mm -hmm. They were more in the class. Yes. Um, why, the thing that's noticeable is the instructor goes on for 10 minutes, according to his placard, and the students are all just tuned out. And the, the instructor just keeps talking on, isn't even aware that the class isn't even listening. So it's, that no one's mentioned that. Mm -hmm. So before we start the interactive portion, right, there is a portion where the instructor is lecturing, and then the instructor has a discussion. Right, so that it's like some clear boundaries between the type of activities going on in the class and the way the students are reacting. So, sorry, you wanted to add something? Well, it just makes you wonder about the instructor that they would go on totally unaware the class is asleep. Mm -hmm. But that's real too sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> we also have the issue of a really keen and obviously well studied student who's been rebuffed by the instructor and uh, has even tried to attempt some relationship with her peers. And um, so the instructor, um, or maybe so the three solid seats facing forward, has not helped her um, connect so and, make, and make bridges with, with her students. So Paula, you mean, is trying to uh, connect? Or Sahar is Sahar, trying to connect? Sahar, Sahar, Sahar? Mm -hmm. she, she tried to connect with Paula and Tom. But also mm, at the beginning at the of beginning. the skit, yeah. so three times she's shown her eagerness to connect and to get information and to be part of a team. Mm -hmm. and, in, and so far, um, she's still hanging out there completely isolated in that um, effort. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to ask Sahara actually, how was this last time, was it different than other times for you? Can you say something about that? Um, in the first time we presented, I felt like uncomfortable and there was more of a spotlight when the comment was made and when the teacher, the teacher basically took that spotlight away from me is how I felt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like made it less uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So you were able to participate. Yeah. Although earlier what happened was you were trying to engage and that wasn't working. So I'm trying to decide if we should have one more because we did have a hand up for one more intervention. Okay, wait one sec. I can't even hear you so from just here. So. After asking for where this comment came from, and she would say this is just my impression from the book, I think that she or the class uh, will have to do more research, and they ask for research paper about the like domestic violence in the Iranian culture, and then related to like Islamic culture, and then compare it to the Canadian culture, and does domestic violence exist? And mm -hmm. so just make them think, not just first impression, but really do work, not just this mm -hmm. is how I got it. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know what the instructor's plan was for the themes afterwards, right? So I can tell you. You can tell us what her, yeah, we know, Joanne knows what her plan is. But yeah, so one possibility is to then get the students to get engaged and do more research. That may have been this instructor's, the initial instructor's plan as well, right? That doesn't necessarily stop the comments that you are surprised by. Mm -hmm. Can you try to project? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, here comes a mic. Thanks. Um, I one approach I thought of is like I don't really want to go up there to present, but I want one idea I thought have is like when instructors start asking about the theme, they talk about the theme of the book. Um, she could start to ask a student to participate in discussion between students for two to five minutes about what you perceive from the book mm -hmm. and then kind of uh, have a group a presentation about 
this group, what, what theme that you come up with in the book already, which is your own discussion, is to go through different groups, so get more uh, classroom dis uh, participation. And mm -hmm. then they kind of, uh, you know, uh, con conclude on the, on the paper. So a possibility would be to get the students to do group work first, thinking about the themes. Now, I have a kind of question. Given what transpired between these students, amongst these students, in the large class, what do you, do you think the same conversation might have transpired in a small group? That's kind of a leading question. I guess what I'm sort of throwing out is that there is a possibility that the same comment that Paula made in the large class might have been made in the small group to Sahar directly, right? In, in which case, you still have those interactions going on, but now you don't see that they're happening necessarily. Not to say we shouldn't do small group work, but just to kind of raise our awareness of some of the risks, right? Which is something that we should, yeah, know and think about how to address and approach. So there are just maybe two minutes left to our session. Joanne, you can sit down. You've been standing here patiently for a long time. Applause. Are there any last reflections from you or comments you would want to make on this process, on this moment that we dealt with, or on the overall conversation that we've had? Mm -hmm. Two, I see two. Let me, oh yeah, here we go. I'd love to comment on the process. I think it's a fabulous tool for bringing out um, issues. I, I found I was personally far too petrified to stick my hand up, although I, I played scenarios in my head. So it was incredible, rather than just, Here's the video, check it out. Um, because I had the physical threat of possibly stepping on a stage and my adrenaline was running, I actually ran scenarios. What would I say? What would I do? So there's, I, there's a lot of silent work happening in place, even though it didn't happen there. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm even thinking of it as a, it would be a great exercise for, for small groups to do the theater and then in an online setting, play, play the video and say, okay, now let's stop and, and what would you say? And mm -hmm. it would be a great um, tool for mediating these really complex issues. And there are a variety of places in Vancouver and nearby where you can get training to use this approach and related approaches. So if anyone's interested, feel free to talk to me. Um, you have your hand up, but somebody else did first too. And then um, I was just going to comment on this entire kind of skit where um, Sahara is really put on the spot, right? Just like Tom Astor is your family from Af Afghanistan. And yeah. when uh, Joanne, when you took the spotlight off of her, I saw a sigh of relief because she felt, I felt like you felt really pressured. You had to represent a place you didn't even know. And I was really awkward when you can't justify that I'm, my family's not from there. Well, even if you were from there, you might not know every person, every person from Afghanistan can't speak on behalf of them. So mm -hmm. I thought it was neat. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Right. So one of the things that was really, really going on in this scene, which we haven't named, was some tokenism, right? So people looking to Sahar based on what she looks like to speak for certain groups. And that, I mean, that happens. Yes. And Joanne, you wanted to say something? And then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Very, uh, very quickly, I really appreciated having um, substance from the student actors because it made it more real for me and that's something that I find very powerful that I can try something out and have the student actors re remain in character and respond as those characters would because it gives me a chance to push an idea and see whether it's working so I find it extremely powerful so thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Um, I just want to very quickly name the actors to recognize their work. This down here is Sarah Schroeder. Come on up, Sarah. And Sahara Lalani, Tom Hearn, and Paula Zelaya Cervantes. So thank you very much. Hopefully you'll join us with other opportunities to rehearse for the future. Thank you. No, thank you. I think that this was a really powerful approach, and I, and I was doing exactly the same thing. You know, it's like, I could go up there, but no way. And just thinking through, but it also, what, what I found intriguing as well was when at the beginning of this, I have things for you people, don't go away. Um, at the beginning when, you, when um, Yael said, I know everybody feels like they could rewrite this completely and say, well, I wouldn't happen because I would have them do this, that, and the other, but something still could have come up. And I think that's the, the interesting piece of, you can't always completely plan, but you kind of 
think about, you know, a little more about how you approach it. So thank you very much. Um, just a reminder, well, there's food over there and I'm keeping you from it, but as well we have the wiki um, experience of contributing to the ongoing World Cafe Dialogue. Please do feel free to do that. There are people over there that if I said wiki and you went what? Um, I actually think they had a name, one type of wiki, what's a wiki, because they have all sorts of names for them. But there are people over there that can help you use them and then you can walk away with one new skill for the day. So enjoy lunch and we'll reconvene at 115 or one, what, which? I see one, I hear 115, anything else? Sorry, it turned into an auction. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>